Welcome to Crafty Sourcer. If you're looking for a raw, unfiltered podcast on all things sourcing in APAC, you've come to the right place. Grab a coffee or wine and join your host and other guests as we dive deep into the complex and ever-evolving world of sourcing, keeping you informed on insights, tools, and even at times, a healthy sourcing debate or two. Now, here's your host, Denise Pereira from Kaleidosource. Settle in and let's get crafty. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hi, everyone. And we are back with another episode. And today I'm very, very excited because our guest is all the way from the city of lakes. And I could be wrong. So the guest is going to correct me. And that is, <laughs> he is from Minneapolis. So if you have not read his blog called Visit Saucer or one of his 23 books or read one of his articles on SourceCon, which is mainly on sourcing and recruiting, you're missing out on some fantastic content. <laughs> Also, if you stay tuned till the end, there is a bonus question for our listeners where you can grab one of Jonathan Tedder's free (laughs) ebooks. So please keep listening. Let's get into it and let's get crafty. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. Thank you so much. Honored to be here too as well. (laughs) Jonathan, before we get into the chat, um, I'm sure everybody knows who you are. But anyways, can you please give us a quick intro for those that are listening? Yeah, of course. Um, For me, I have been a recruiter for 12 years. And boy, has the time flown by these dozen years (laughs) or so. I I started at a company called AGS as kind of a a tech sourcer. And I started um, at kind of an MSP account and uh, working on an internal TA team. And and it evolved from there, too. So just I started internally, and then I went agency, and then I went back to internal. And um, now I'm currently at Amazon. I've been there for about five, five and a half years or so. And it's been a great experience too. So right now I'm focused on tech sourcing. And I know the market isn't the best right now, but we're hanging there. We're hopefully this uh, upcoming year will be a lot better for people too at the same time. You've seen the full spectrum of what TA is, right? So yes. you've been there, done that, seen the ups and downs, the challenges, the wins that come with it. <laughs> Oh, yes, definitely. Even my career, I started during the recession of 2011, too. So I kind of experienced that at the beginning. And there's been ups and downs in our career. And, and uh, But I'm very optimistic about 2024 and onwards of 2025. I think we, we definitely have a bright future in TA. And Jonathan, with your extensive experience in, in recruiting as a whole, you've obviously worked across global companies, uh, done various roles, you've witnessed firsthand the evolution of the recruitment landscape, right? Whether you've been a recruiter, whether you've been a sourcer. So you obviously understand the complexities or the aspects of those complexities that sit within talent acquisition. So with the recruitment industry sort of undergoing so many changes now, especially with AI being a part of our life day in, day out, I'm really interested in hearing your insights on a topic that often I feel sparks some form of debate among professionals in TA. So how do you how do you sort of see the glaring differences between a recruiter and a sourcer and how you've seen sort of sourcing evolve from what it used to be? You know, that is such an interesting question too. I would say sourcers, I would say around 2010, 2011, when I first started, they were really focused on lead generation. So finding contact information, a talent bin, you know, hire tool, a seek out, all those tools were kind of coming into the marketplace and people were getting excited. Connectifier was another one. Remember that one, that extension? And um, my days were really, it was focused on finding information and then reaching out to candidates to, or, you know, creating Excel docs and then sending that list to recruiters on my team who would then do the engagement and kind of reach out to people. Um, we've evolved now too. So even sourcers um, were more evolved And we've changed now to more, we're focused more on kind of the outreach side of of kind of sourcing. So now um, sourcers are reaching out to candidates, they're engaging people, they're doing the first initial phone screens, and then they're submitting candidates onward to as well. Um, Recruiters, full cycle recruiters, they do the full process. That hasn't changed too much, I would say. Um, But it's interesting. Every single company that I've worked for has done it a little different too. So I've done full cycle. I've done just being a recruiter, 
tech recruiter. I've done sourcing. Uh, at Amazon, it's kind of interesting. We have two different types of roles. We have a sourcing recruiter and then a client lead. And I'm a sourcing recruiter L6. And um, basically, what I do is I reach out to people. I engage them. I I screen them. I submit them to the role. And then they go through the process. And uh, prior to kind of the final round interview, I would then introduce them to kind of a client lead. And then the client lead would then you know, talk over um, the role, the team, prepare them for the final round. And then uh, if they did get the offer, the client lead would then present the offer afterwards. So it's kind of interesting how um, it's a little different. So I know Meta is pretty similar. Google, you know, is very similar to Amazon too as well, where they've kind of split it up to they've realized that comps are so technical and complicated um, that it makes sense just to have someone just solely focused as kind of a client lead to kind of do that. So, um, but it, it's interesting. Like I said, every company does a little different. I would say some smaller companies consider sourcers to be kind of lower level recruiters. And I would not say that's a thing. I would say sourcers are very technical, tech savvy. You need to really hone in on your skills to be able to screen candidates and interview people. And um, they're just as good as recruiters. So I've done both. And it's still confusing for me too as well. You make a very good point because I've also worked in organizations where the sourcer plays a different part based on how the function is set up. And do you think it comes down to lack of awareness of on the business's part or whoever's sort of managing the function? Do you think there's a gap of knowledge there? Around I think so. What their understanding of sourcing is? Yes, and I think so. And I've worked at companies where I was the first sourcer brought in. And once I was there, they're like, holy moly, you are so vital <laughs> to the success too, because uh, just uh, posting a job and the, letting it sit out there for 60 to 90 days and not getting the right applicants, the, the right applicant flow, um, yeah. they would then use like external agencies and they do fulfill a great need for that um, in some cases, but um, sourcers can fulfill that too as well. This is a debate that probably won't go away and we see it come up every, every now and then. But let's sort of talk about the thing that is looming around everybody's minds right now. And I and obviously it's been there since 2022. There is no doubt, Jonathan, you've got an <laughs> impressive background. Everybody knows who you are. And if nobody knows who you are, they absolutely need to be, you know, checking you out. <laughs> With your background in recruiting, you've authored so many books. Like I was saying to you before we started, I don't know how you have the time and where you got the time to write 23 books. And you've written it on on subjects that are so close to our hearts. You know, I'm really curious about your overall perspective on the integration of AI in talent sourcing. Because in your latest mm. book in AI talent sourcing, Chat GPT prompts, which I read, you sent th- you sent that through to me. You talk about the intersection of AI and talent sourcing. How do you think AI has transformed or will transform that landscape of tech recruiting compared to the methods that we are used to or some of the traditional methods that people are used to? Right. Great question, too. And I know AI, it's, AI has been around for many, many years, but now with the release of uh, generative AI tools like ChatGPT, Claude, Bard, there's so many now. Uh, people are kind of realizing, holy moly, we can use this within recruiting and, and other industries, too. HR sales, marketing. Um, There was a recent study by NPR. They said that 70% of corporate jobs could be impacted by AI within the future too. So it's not only recruiting, it's every industry from engineers to, you know, uh, developers to whoever else is on your team. Uh, It's going to be crazy to kind of see kind of a future shift of how AI will impact recruiting. Right now, um, you could use it for mundane tasks, so searching, writing, talent mapping, uh, but there's lots of different like extension tools, plugins that are coming um, that could really help in different areas too. Will it fully automate the process? Um, I mean, I don't, I'm hopeful that it won't, but there's some tools that claim it could, but I'm hopeful that um, in the States and, and America that we'll have certain laws that kind of come and say, hey, you can't do this um, for AI or uh, ranking resumes or profiles within an ATS system, uh, et cetera. 
we'll have to see what the future holds. I think just we're kind of just like witnessing kind of an iceberg effect of like what will come, you know, give it five, 10, 20 years, we'll see kind of a, a larger impact of where it started and then where it's, where it's going to. And I, but I think every industry will be impacted in this area. Well, you make a good point because when you think about supermarkets, um, at least here in Australia, we've got, they've slowly rolled out and now most of the supermarkets have self-service checkouts mm. and the use, the, the need for customer service is kind of dying away. And I think the Australian supermarkets are taking a leaf out of the European supermarkets, the American supermarkets, the Japanese supermarkets, where you just do self-service now. So the need of having a person physically there is now slowly diminishing away, which mm. means obviously jobs are being taken away and you just do self-service, just self-serve yourself. So, but it is going to be interesting to see. And I think people are to a large extent scared about what that means for them, because if you have no job, you have no income. And no income means you can't put food on your table, you can't pay your bills. What what else can we do? Um, <laughs> do we start selling yes. t-shirts on eBay? Um, <laughs> exactly, right? What do we yeah. do too? And I would say uh, for recruiters and sourcers, I would say embrace the change and also continue to kind of read, you know, attend lectures, you know, read books, mm -hmm. listen to podcasts like this one, you know, do whatever you can to stay motivated, but also uh, updated on all these changes that are happening and the thing is it's here to stay we can't run away from it right if you think about the when the internet first came out when mobile phones first came out we had to embrace it we had to get with with what was out there we couldn't run away from it we were no longer using you know the dial phones that we had that our grandmothers and grandparents and our parents <laughs> were using we had to start using mobile phones that was so big and clunky they were almost like those radio phones like you know i don't know if you remember but they were really big when they first came out and expensive, so nobody could actually afford them. And then they started to dilute it because they made it more affordable for people to use. So we, you're right, we have to get with it. And that's a really good piece of advice that we need to be reading, we need to be following what's happening, where it's being impacted, and how we can sort of stay in the game for as long as we can. Yeah, agreed. Again, going back to your 23 books, Jonathan, because I'm really <laughs> impressed. I don't know how someone has so much time to write the books because, and you've written on so many topics that's related to talent acquisition, but you've touched on so many di different things. You've spoken about sourcing tools. You've talked about the techniques. You know, it's one of your books is um, Top Talent Sourcing Tools for Recruiters, Basic Bullion Strings for Recruiters. With the times evolving so fast, what would you say are some of the most innovative tools or techniques you've come across recently or that you use in your day-to-day -day work, which has been enhanced by AI that we need to be considering or embracing now? Yeah, I continue to kind of do demos and I recommend people do the same kind of thing. I try to follow uh, software companies on LinkedIn for updates to kind of stay updated. I, I, a lot of people ask me to like, how do you know so much? And it's just like, make sure to follow the right tools and industries. And then people start to kind of share stuff. But one particular tool that's very interesting is called Bland AI. And it's a phone screen automation tool. So this tool will contact someone and you think it's a live person, which is very interesting. And it will phone screen that person with questions too as well. So you will, you'll what? get a message, you'll pick it up and you'll be like, hi, this is agent, blah, blah, blah. I see you applied for this role. I've got some questions. Um, is this a good time to chat? And it sounds like a human and it really can like, based on what you respond back to it, it's, it's pretty accurate for the response too. So that's, it's kind of scary yeah. when you look at that. And, um, you know, I would say smaller companies could use this as a way to automate, okay, instead of having one recruiter, I could just use an AI tool to screen people. And, and then I could, within this AI tool, I could make sure, hey, I'm, I'm targeting someone with five years of experience in this location, you know, and with this amount of skills too. So um, that was kind of interesting too. Um, there's other ones that are coming out. Um, I like MetaView. That's a, that's a newer one, MetaView AI. It's pretty cool, too. I'm sure yeah. you're aware of that one, too. Yeah. It's kind of like Zoom, but then it tells you kind of some phone um, screening questions. I like that one more because, hey, 
A, you, you still are human <laughs> and yeah. you're still talking to someone over kind of like a Zoom call mm-hmm. and, and giving you technical kind of questions to d- different prompts and you're able to kind of respond back more quickly and it, it records everything and it keeps you organized too. So I think that's hopefully more AI tools where it's like, hey, you still need a human <laughs> <laughs> to use the tool and hey, you don't need to fully automate, but there's... I'm aware, we're aware of of tools that are coming where like, hey, we fully automated phone screen interviews and you can just call this number and they'll they'll interview you and they'll send you the the recording and they'll tell you if the person's a good match or not. So it's like- Do you have to do like a, do you have to upload your voice so that it kind of mirrors that? I think you could choose the voice that you want. So there's a couple different voice voice female or male voice that you can Hmm. so it's all ai generated too as well so but it sounds very human too so they call it a voice clone too which is interesting right that's it because i don't know if you've heard of 11 labs they do something very similar so you just like record your own voice on your iphone or android and just upload it and then they clone your voice and it's really scary because it sounds exactly like you and then you just put a script in and you're like hi i'm jonathan kidder i'm an author of 23 (laughs) books and it and it sounds exactly like you, so it's scary. Wow. Yeah. Give it Can a try. it like? Yeah, I'll have to take a look at that one. Can it like yeah. respond back to someone's questions? Like, hey, I haven't this played around that. I just discovered Minnesota. it yesterday, to be honest. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I haven't yeah. played around with it that much. But to your point, it's actually really freaky because it can be a game changer. But when you think about scams from a scam oh, perspective, yeah. oh my god. Yeah, deep, deep yeah. face or whatever, where it's mm-hmm. like. You know, it, it's it's scary too. So um, it's so interesting though at the it same is. time. It is. I mean, there's so much out there and I know my my mind gets blown because you're trying to keep up with, with everything. Every, every day there's a new AI tool or platform that's out there and it's so hard to keep up. And that's why it's like for us, it's always about what problem are we trying to solve? One is that yep. and then one is what are you interested in learning? Because the more you go out and start, you know, trying to unpick what AI tools are out there, you're just going to keep going down a rabbit hole. Yep, and I call that kind of the the shiny toy syndrome of recruiters (laughs) too. So you, there's so many new tools, and hey, I want to try this or I want to do this, and they kind of come fast, but then they leave fast too as well. Mm -hmm. So recognize, Mm -hmm. hey, I want to find something for finding content information, or I want to use something with an AI. Yeah, outreach, then uh, play around, do demos of different tools, and then just kind of go from there. I feel like this year is going to be the rise of probably small micro sort of SaaS companies cropping up, offering some form of AI something to companies. Um, Because we're seeing it with so many tools on the market at the moment. It's so hard to sift through like what it is that you need or or what, what do you want? Yeah. And Mm. yeah, it's, and I think uh, like companies always target recruiting like this, we can solve recruiting. And then you (laughs) talk to the company. Have you ever recruited? No. (laughs) Have you ever worked in recruiting or staffing? No. So it's kind of like, oh, that happens a lot. And we created a a tool because we know what your problem is. (laughs) Yeah. So there's a lot of people like that. So, but yeah, it'll be interesting. Give it, you know, five to 10 years. What will change? Um, Yeah. Yeah. It'll be interesting. It's going to be very interesting. And, and this kind of segues very well into our last question, Jonathan, mm-hmm. is, again, going back to your, your books, right? So you've written on diversity, you've written on candidate experience, even hiring managers. So that really shows a deep understanding of the multifaceted approach that we take within talent acquisition, right? Talking about ethical considerations in AI, and I think this is where TA is kind of being a little slow Uh-oh. in implementing AI. When integrating AI into talent sourcing or the talent acquisition function, what do you think should be some ethical considerations recruiters, sources should be keeping in mind to ensure that there is a massive form of fairness and that there's a lot of inclusion involved in how we portray ourselves and conduct ourselves? Yeah, you know, I was really thinking over this question too, and it also it brings up a couple different things too. So, um, diversity, inclusion too. So, if you have AI ranking resumes, they might rank you based on the school that you went to, or um, so it, it kind of 
kicks out people based off that, or another one is age discrimination too. So maybe you have too much experience and it's just going to cut you out too. So there is, um, in some ways, you need kind of a human to kind of review that and be kind of more non-biased, I would say. So, and I don't think currently AI is capable of doing that. I might be wrong, but I don't think that could... Uh, Currently, it, it could be used for that in that area, too. I know I've, I had a friend who recently applied to a position in California, and during the application process, it asked her, um, would you mind if AI will review your, your resume and if there's any you know, future positions, we'll be able to reach out to you in the, in the future, too. So you're, you're able to select in their ATS system, yes, have my resume get interwoven with an AI. So um, I think there's ATS systems that are coming and kind of starting to do that, but that's a little worrisome for me. So I'm, I'm, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm call me a little old school <laughs> with that um, in a sense. So, um, so yeah, I think um, companies have two roads here. So either they're really just focused on the bottom line, the dollar to they're trying to cut costs they're going to go that route. They're going to use AI to fully automate everything. And then B, there's people that, okay, we're more human <laughs> and we focus on relationships. We want to be more human focused and we're going to invest in humans, recruiters, sourcers, and we're going to focus on the can experience, DEI sourcing, all those different areas that are very important too. So we're going to see two shifts, companies in A and then companies in B. You know, I think that's going to happen too as well. So I don't know. What What do you think? It kind of reminded me of um, a couple of years, I think maybe two and a half, three years ago, I was in, I won't say a specific country, but I was in the UAE and um, mm -hmm. I was walking down the, the street and there was an ad. Um, it was like a brochure outside a store and it said, we're looking for salespeople, but Filipinos only. And I was like, wow. So this is like direct discrimination in a way that only yeah. Filipinos. And then one day on LinkedIn, from that same country, someone had posted, we are looking for X, Y, Z sort of people, but people over the age of 54, men over the age of 54 should not apply. And I'd taken out a screenshot and I sent it to my brother because my brother lives in the same country. And I was like, hmm. what kind of discrimination is this? And this is humans discriminating so not even ai so it kind of led me to think if humans are already discriminating can we imagine what ai is going to do as well in the back end yeah so it's scary right you could it's almost like that show what is that show called um oh, it was on netflix like black what's it uh is it the one where they think of the future like the yeah Amazon? yeah but it's, it's just black mirror no not black, black mirror. mirror yes that's yes. it yes um exactly where it's like yeah. oh my gosh you know if you don't fit within this algorithm or or breaking system like you're yeah. not going to be employed yeah. in the future too so i think yeah. hopefully uh, politicians in the u.s for us recognize that i know in new york they are passing laws where hey you can't use ai to rank applicants or resumes so i'm hopeful that that will kind of trickle into other states or yeah. just across the u.s where hey you can't use this but who knows and i think this is probably going to be the top concern for any exec trying to get any sort of ai implemented in whatever function especially right. when it comes to people so right. in, in a people function, I think this is where they're going to really struggle. And any company that's building any sort of AI platform or tools has to make sure that there's no biasness in there, in whichever shape or form, you know, try and mitigate those risks because we are in, in, a, in a people sort of function and industry and we have to be taking care of people, right? So, yeah. Well, Jonathan, that was the last question. And do you want to ask the bonus question so that, any of our listeners get one of your free, amazing eBooks. I've got a copy, sure. so I'm going to read it as well. So, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, here's the question. So when was uh, my top talent sourcing tools for recruiters volume two book published? When was it published too? Yes. So um, my second book of, the, of my top talent sourcing tools, really it focuses a lot on AI, web scraping, automation tools, um, 
lot of updated things. So definitely take a look at that book too as well. And definitely um, take a look at the other books that Jonathan has poured a lot of love and time into as well. If you go to Visit Sosa, there's heaps of information on there. When we drop the episode, we will drop the links to wherever you can find Jonathan. Actually, you just go to Google, type Jonathan Kidder. You'll find <laughs> heaps, heaps of stuff about him. But yes, whoever can find when it was published, please send me a message and then we will obviously choose the lucky winner from there. Jonathan, it's been such a pleasure. I've been following you for so many years. We have, <laughs> we've chatted over the past couple of months, but yes. to finally have you on my show has been a dream. So thank you so much for joining the Crafty Sosa. Thank you so much. Thank you and stay crafty, everyone. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode. And we'll be back next week with another exciting episode. If you found this valuable, don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. That helps others find the show and we greatly appreciate it. Once again, happy sourcing and stay crafty. Until next time.